Well, I think that it's the case that interest in Korean culture has boomed in the last few years. I wonder how many of you have watched Squid Game or perhaps seen the movie Parasite. Well, you might have been watching those on your Samsung Galaxy tablet as you were eating your kimchi. On the other hand, you might have preferred to turn on your Sony television to watch an anime movie as you were eating your sushi. On the other hand, you might have decided to go to the cinema getting into your Hyundai or Toyota car. Well, my point is that now the manufacturing exports and cultural exports from Korea and Japan are all around us. The growth of these two economies since the Second World War, Korea and Japan, have been remarkable. The Gresham College lecture that you're listening to right now is giving you knowledge and insight from one of the world's leading academic experts. Making it takes a lot of time, but because we want to encourage a love of learning, we think it's well worth it. We never make you pay for lectures, although donations are needed. All we ask in return is this. Send a link to this lecture to someone you think would benefit, and if you haven't already, click the follow or subscribe button from wherever you're listening right now. Now, let's get back to the lecture. After the Second World War, there was a choice, I think, in developing economies to adopt one of two policies. They were both economic nationalism, but of a different type. The first was import substituting industrialization. That is, replacing imported manufacturers from the advanced industrial economies. Replacing those with local goods produced behind tariff walls. Such an approach was pursued particularly by Latin America since the Great Depression. It was economic nationalism based upon isolationism. I'm talking about that in my next lecture. In the lecture today, I'm talking about the other approach, which was export-led growth. Now, this also often went with protection of domestic markets, but it was economic nationalism based upon expansionism, upon exports, and that was the strategy adopted by Japan, by South Korea, and the Asian Tigers. This graph shows you which of those two policies was most successful. <clears throat> if you look at the uh, green line there, that is Argentina, import substituting industrialization, is more or less flat. If you look at the uh, red line, that's Japan, and the blue line, that's Korea. And you see Japan slowed down from the 1890s, Korea has continued to grow. So next time I'm going to look at why on earth Argentina flatlines. Today I want to ask why it was that there has been that success in Korea and Japan. <clears throat> but also, if any of you have watched Squid Game or watched Parasite, you will know that growth and success also has a dark side. I'll come back to that at the end. Now, in order to understand what happened after 1945, I'm a historian, we need to go back to the 19th century. We need to understand the historical background of this. It takes us back to Japan and the Meiji Restoration of 1868 and its annexation of Korea as part of the Japanese Empire in 1910. <clears throat> so let's go to Japan to start with. Japan was unique in Asia in that it achieved modernization and maintained independence by its own efforts. But that was not a foregone conclusion. It could have gone another way. Japan could have become like China. It could have become like semi-colonized. Japan had a very limited engagement with foreign traders until the arrival of the so-called black ships of Commodore Matthew Perry of the United States arrived in Japan in July 1853. He was sent by the United States 
to establish relations with Japan. Now, you might wonder what was meant by relations. Uh, what it meant was he would come to them to force them to open to American goods. The outcome was the US-Japan Treaty of Amity and Commerce in 1858, which is modelled on the, on the Chinese example of the treaty ports, the forced opening up of, of China to Western goods. It was, a, it was called an unequal treaty, and Japan was forced to negotiate other unequal treaties with uh, France, with Britain, and so on. <clears throat> so the question here was how to respond to make sure that Japan did not go the way of China or India or Vietnam or wherever. The Tokugawa regime, which dominated Japan since 1603, looked weak when Perry arrived, and the country, it seemed, could descend the same way as China. So what was the nature of that Tokugawa regime? It was based upon what I would call Neo-Confucianism, that is, a rigid hierarchy which limited change, minimal foreign contact, the idea here that uh, it was all hierarchical like a household, a patriarchal household. The emperor of Japan was based in Kyoto, <clears throat> and his role was ceremonial. He had no military or financial authority. The administration was in the hands of the shogun, who was based in modern-day Tokyo, what was then called Edo. This Tokugawa clan held it directly about a quarter of Japan. Other local lords, the daimyo, pledged allegiance to the shogun. Some of those daimyo were hereditary vassals of the Tokugawa, they participated in the government. They were insiders. Others had been forced into submission. Uh, they were defeated. They were marginalized. They were called the Tozama. So you've got this divide within the elite. The Tokugawa shogun kept authority by requiring these daimyo lords to spend every other year in Edo, where their wives and children were to live permanently. It was a sort of hostage system. Provided the daimyo, when they went back to their local area, didn't threaten the, the shogun in, in Edo, they were given a fair degree of autonomy. So it was not a highly centralized system. Then the next group are the samurai, the military elite, who owed allegiance either to the shogun, if they were part of the Tokugawa clan, or to these individual daimyo. They wore swords, they had warrior values, but they didn't actually fight because it was peace. They were basically bureaucrats. They provided bureaucratic services to the shogun, they collected taxes and so on. So that's what was existing before the black sh ship arrived. But it was starting to have difficulties even before the arrival of the black, ship, black ships. Now, what were those difficulties? Well, first of all, the Tokugawa in Edo had limited finances. They had income from their own lands, but the daimo in the individual territories, they collected tax themselves. They didn't give it to the central government <coughs> in Edo. So there was a lack of fiscal capacity. So if you're going to stand up to the Americans, how are you going to pay to fight them? In fact, there was a lack of military capacity as well. The shogun only had his own samurai, who were armed with swords. He couldn't rely upon the samurai of the individual lords elsewhere. And are they going to be able to stand up to Western military power? And finally, the rigid hierarchy of society was breaking down. The daimo had started to borrow money from merchants, the samurai were hard up. There was inflation after trade opened up, but the samurai are paid on a fixed stipend. So they're getting a little bit upset and annoyed 
at their status being uh, eroded. And those outside lords at Tazambo, they are feeling excluded and, and, and alienated. So Japan is highly vulnerable. So what's going to be done about it? There's a terminal crisis in the Tokugawa regime. There's a falling out within the Tokugawa themselves. Who's going to become the next shogun? So they're fighting with each other, which is not very helpful. Then you've got these unequal treaties being imposed upon Japan. One response to that is to say isolationism. Let's not allow these Western traders to come in. The phrase used was, let us revere the emperor and expel the barbarians, i.e. the Americans and the British. And that line was originally taken by some of the, uh, the key figures within these, uh, these lordships, particularly by Okuba Toshimichi of the Satsuma and Ito Horobumi of the, of the Chozu clans. But they started to realise you can't just fight the barbarians by staying the same. You have to adapt in order to fight. And how do you adapt? Well, I used to teach at University College London, a great institution. You send your students to University College London. So this man, Ito, who I just mentioned, said, if you're going to beat them, you've got to join them. So he went to University College London up the road in 1863, and the other clan, the Chosu, said 19 students to study in British universities. At the same time, the imperial courtiers down in Kyoto are starting to become a centre of criticism of the uh, shogun up in, up in Edo. And that links up with the resentment by the samurai uh, who are feeling that they're losing their status and these outside families of the Satsuma, the Chosu, also feeling they're being excluded. So there's an alliance between the courtiers down in Kyoto and these uh, excluded lords. And they say, what we're going to do is we're going to reimpose the rule of the emperor. We're going, they seized the palace in Kyoto, they took power in the name of the emperor, and they then imposed this new Meiji restoration. The new emperor Meiji was put on the throne in 1868. It was a, a combination of court nobles and these excluded Daimo lords from southwest Japan. In 1868, they signed a charter oath which said they were going to unite together all groups in justice, welfare, and prosperity, owning allegiance to the emperor and not to their individual lordships. In order to make sure they didn't then follow the root of China being subordinated. The idea then was not to expel the barbarians and return to isolationism. It was to pursue rapid modernization by adopting Western institutions, by creating a centralized and unified nation, which unlike the Tokugawa, would have the political power over the whole country with the capacity to raise revenue. The barbarians, could then be dealt with on equal terms within a global economy, within great power politics. It was a policy of building national strength through expansionist nationalism, export-led nationalism. Now, in order to do that, there had to be some major changes in Japan's economy, politics, and society. So let me move on to, uh, on to that, so going, going ahead too far. First of all, after 1868, power largely remained with the leaders of the Restoration. They did bring in retainers of the Tokugawa, where administrative expertise was needed. But essentially, it was this small group which took power in 1868, remained in control. They replaced loyalty to the individual domain with loyalty to Japan. The daimo, the individual lords, agreed to return lands to the emperor, and they would then be appointed themselves governors of their local area. 
under the, under the emperor. They were given noble status and a salary. The state then took over payment of the salaries of the samurai, so their loyalty now was also to the emperor. And in 1876, that, in, that annual salary was replayed by a lump sum. They lost their warrior status, and a conscript army was created from 1872. So it all meant a major change, the creation of a nation state. Now, as you might imagine, uh, that led to um, a degree of um, annoyance uh, and, and, of, and of upset. I think that's got out of control. Here we are. Um, the There's a difference over how, how to proceed. And one approach was of Iwakawa Tom, Tomomi, who was one of the courtiers, who went on a mission uh, to, um, to, there we are, to uh, San Francisco and then to, to London. There he is in the middle in traditional dress with the people from those clans I, I, I talked about. They're the samurai, there's the emperor Meiji. So they go to negotiate in Europe and America in 1871 to try to renegotiate the unequal treaties in which they were unsuccessful. This led him to argue then, coming back, I must push forward with domestic reform if I'm going to stand up to the barbarians. He returned to, to, uh, to, to Tokyo in 1873. But the opposition from the isolationists uh, still continued uh, when, he, when he got back. There was a feeling that identity of the samurai was being lost, that the, the, the daimos were losing their, their, their power. And you then have the Satsuma Rebellion, where disaffected samurai are uh, rising revolt, and they're put down by a cons the conscript army, the, the, modern, the modern army. So that was in 1877. The effective end of the samurai as a class, uh, the emergency of a highly centralised state with Western-style armed forces. So the strategy of competing with the barbarians through reforming Japan society is working. You have the defeat of China in the war of 1894-5 over Korea. Korea was seen as a dagger at the heart of Japan. If Korea could become dominated by China, it would not be a buffer against the Russians. So you need to Fight, make sure you keep the, the Russians and the Chinese out of Korea. And how do you do that? You go to Newcastle upon Tyne and you order a few battleships, uh, which you see there being launched at, at uh, the, the Armstrong Works in, in Newcastle. And you also defeat the, the Russians in the war of 1904 to five. There's one of those ships uh, that I just showed you being built in Newcastle, defeating the, uh, the, the, the uh, Russian uh, Navy and Army. And this leads to the uh, taking over of the uh, Korea, uh, initially as a protectorate in 1905, and then by uh, fully annexed as a part of the Japanese Empire in 1910. It means then that by the First World War, Japan is a great power. It becomes an ally of Britain uh, in, this, uh, in, in the First World War. It emerges a powerful economy and a player in great power rivalries. So how is, how is this achieved? It's achieved by, first of all, adopting a new civil and criminal code, an educational system, financial institutions derived from uh, the uh, European example. In 1885, Japan has a cabinet government in place of that post-restoration oligarchy I, talk, I talked about. A new constitution in 1889. The emperor is still there as an appeal to tradition, as sacred and inviolable, the father of the people. But it's now a bureaucracy, a cabinet, and armed forces 
answerable to him. It draws together this idea of an imperial past and divinity with modernity. You can combine change, which could be upsetting and destabilizing, with a continuity through this means with Japanese values. A constitution was created with an elected assembly, a diet, but with a very limited franchise of only about 1% of the population, with an upper house of nobles. But the power of that parliament, of that diet, was limited because of the powerful status of the emperor, competing elites of the cabinet, the military, the privy council, the bureaucracy, and an unconstitutional, unofficial background group of these old oligarchs. When the diet started to flex its muscles, the government clamped down on mass politics. It suppressed mass politics in the peace police law of 1900. It's all very authoritarian. It also means that the government has taxing powers. Now the individual lordships have been suspended and now taxes created nationally can fund the army and the navy, which I was just showing you. But the army and navy has considerable power answerable only to the emperor, largely free of control by the legislature. And the bureaucracy was also very powerful. They could appeal over the head of the people and of the parliament to the will of the emperor. They could use that power against politicians. Now, all of this is very important for having a strategy of economic development. And this is what these people, these bureaucrats, army and the navy, embark on. J Japan embarks on industrialization. Let me just run through that uh, quickly. Well, you see, the first railway comes in Yokohama, along with a postal system, education being built up. The Japanese were sent abroad to study at, at universities in, in Britain and, and elsewhere. Foreigners were invited to Japan to bring in new technology, but it was always under the control of the Japanese themselves, not foreign ownership and control. You pay for those goods, that imported technology, by exports, particularly of silk and then of cotton cloth but also by squeezing savings out of the people domestically. Very high level of savings, taxation, squeezing domestic consumption, squeezing welfare to invest in industry. You, do, you ban foreign investment to make sure it's not taken, taken over of firms within Japan. Instead, the government borrows money on the London money market uh, through government bonds under its own control. So you're making sure that money is being brought in, but not leading to control by foreigners. And those funds are directed by the Bank of Japan to make sure that it's going to Japanese firms, not to foreign owners. The government itself directly invested in some industry, but mainly through buying licenses from overseas technology, blueprints, prototypes, Again, under Japanese control, and working with, on the whole, private enterprise, under government guidance. And it's those government bureaucrats I mentioned, and businessmen coming from similar backgrounds, and many bureaucrats moving into business. And what you have happening then is the growth of these big new business conglomerates. The Zaibatsu. Mitsui was one of the largest. It was a merchant family under the Tokugawa. They grow into mining, textile, cement, paper, real estate, trading, in this pyramid structure, with one family owner at the top, holding company with subsidiaries below. They offer lifetime employment to workers with good conditions and training. But alongside them, there's a whole group of small firms dependent upon them. So if there is a recession, you lay off those small firms. The small firms are also supplying local markets with traditional goods. Now, by the 1930s, the power of these zaibatsus, such as Mitsui, 
is considered to be getting out of control. It's a state within a state. In 1932, the managing director of Mitsui was assassinated by a right-wing radical. Mitsui responds by trying to work with the military in invading Manchuria, providing loans and goods to Japanese expansionism. But there's still a degree of scepticism about these. These are seen as a threat to the state. What happens is that a new group of Zaibatsu emerge which are more dependent upon the military. And you've probably heard of Nissan, their big factory now up in Sunderland. Nissan was a new Zaibatsu which relocated its headquarters to Manchuria, the area in China invaded by the Japanese. Their headquarters were in Manchuria and Nissan held a 50% stake with the Japanese government in the Manchurian Heavy Industry Development Corporation. I'll come back to that again in a minute. So what you're having here is this development of heavy industrialization through with the army, with the bureaucracy. There's, there's still a sense of vulnerability here, the, the, the feeling that in order to be, to, to, to be successful, you have to expand. Japan lacks natural resources. You have to expand in Manchuria. You have to expand, eventually, of course, by uh, going to war with, uh, with, with uh, uh, the Americans, the British, the French, uh, taking, trying to invade those, um, those parts of the European emperor, empires in, in uh, Asia. So what you have, though, I think, in this period of the 1930s and the war is very powerful control by the army. The ministers of the army and the navy in the cabinet were appointed by the army and the navy. So they had a control, a veto power over the cabinet. If the army and navy refused to appoint the cabinet members, the cabinet couldn't work. So they had a veto power. There's emperor worship, sacred patriotism, allied with the militarization of society to create national unity. The bureaucrats were aiming to reduce the power of at least of the old Zaibatsu and control the economy for national defense. Now, all of that, of course, then leads on to the um, invasion of China in 1937, the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1941, and the defeat eventually in 1945. In 1945, the question was, what would the American occupiers do? How do you reform this system? So what happens then is a process of reform. Democratization, reform of the Constitution of 1889, which was seen as the basis of militarism. Land reform, break up the large land holdings, and which was seen as a basis of militarism, replace large owners with, and with poor tenant farmers, with owner-occupying farmers who would have a stake in society. Break up the Zaibatsu, uh, which was attempted um, in legislation in 1946 and 1947. But that policy was abandoned at the end of 1949, with the result that you have the emergence of a new type of business corporation called the Karatsu, again, Mitsui, Instead of being hierarchical, it's more, if like, a network, affiliates. So it, it, it reshaping it as a more decentralised system of interlocking directors and shareholders, coordinated by a group president, who has a, a group of the presidents of each of these groups have, having a lot, a lot of power. And that continues to run, run alongside small firms. So that's another part of the reform. Labour market reform, trade unions, but trade unions as part of the individual enterprise, working with the firm rather than against the firm. And the next point I would make is the survival of those bureaucrats that I mentioned in Manchuria, that development I was arguing about, the Mitsui Heavy Industrial Development Corporation. The man who was the head of that was uh, Kishu Nobusuke, and working with the head of Nissan, 
Akawa Yoshisuke. These people after the war move into the center of Japanese politics. Their experience in Manchuria, their long experience there, their planning of development there, meant they continue to formulate and implement a coherent economic policy. They had close ties with the conservative parties and businesses. They maintained controls over trade and exchange. The foreign investment law of 1950 prevented inflows of private capital so that firms, American firms like Ford or General Motors, couldn't come in and buy up Japanese businesses. So these people I call the reform bureaucrats from the 1930s kept power. So Kishi developed ideas about control over business from the 1930s in Manchuria, where he was responsible for industrialization there, where he used brute forced labor, slave labor. And he worked there with Aikawa Yoshisuke of Nissan. Well, in 1955, Kishi was one of the founders of the Liberal Democrat Party, which has dominated Japan ever since. He was prime minister from 1957 to 1960. Those two men worked together in Manchuria. They continued to work together in Japan in the 50s. The next point I would make is the reform of public finances. What the government did after the war was give tax breaks to savings, which went into banks. The banks then invested in private business. High, very high levels of saving held down inflation and led to high investment, which could be used for exports. And those savings were deliberately encouraged by the National Salvation Savings Campaign and housewives were encouraged to keep household accounts books. And there she says, I'll keep planning our household finances. Consumption was culturally devalued. You had to save. You had to save in order to invest, in order to encourage development. And that's linked with trade policy. Now, I said that this is economic nationalism. Japan does not open up its economy to outside um, uh, investment or to outside goods. What it's trying to do, though, is to export. Initially, it had a trade deficit covered by American aid. But you don't want to have subordination to America. You want to make sure you escape from that dependence. To regain economic independence, you have to export but also to keep import controls on the domestic market. And that leads to an industrial strategy. The government pushes exports in technologically advanced sectors. It gives priority in, the, in credit, in subsidies, in tax breaks to industries according to their export potential. There is close cooperation between those bureaucrats developing from that reforming bureaucracy of the 1930s with the Kavetsu, through the Ministry of International Trade and Industry, which is the successor to the approach of Kishi back in the 1930s. In 1960, the government announces a new policy. Kishi resigned in 1960. Its successor announces a new policy, the National Income Doubling Plan, driven by exports and government assistance. Kishi's allies at the, that ministry I mentioned had a continuing role, working in partnership with business through what they called administrative guidance. They relied upon business associations, the, two, the minister exchanging information, and the uh, business complying with that. By 1968, Japan had moved to a very large trade surplus. But then it starts to go wrong you have this massive surge in residential property prices. Those savings, that easy credit, a surge. Heavy indebtedness by the Koretsu. You get a bubble, it bursts. And as you saw from the uh, chart I put up at the beginning of the lecture, you have the so-called lost decade of the 1990s. Growth is low, but it then becomes three lost decades. 
Japan stops growing as rapidly as it had in the past. This is where I turn to Korea. Because Korea starts off at a much lower base, but it continues to grow throughout the 90s up to the present. So let's have a look at Korea. Well, Korea didn't have anything like the Meiji Restoration. It had a, uh, had a weak dynasty. Korea was being already uh, as made a client state of China. China was being threatened by Russia. And as I mentioned earlier on, the uh, Japanese take it over as a colony in 1910. So Korea was a Japanese colony from 1910 to 1945. Korean culture was subordinated. The country was turned into a source of food and raw materials for Japan and of industrial production to support the Japanese invasion of China. Even more than in Japan, the economy of Korea was dominated by the state and by the army. Well, the Japanese, of course, retreat, leave in 1945. At that point, Korea is divided at the 38th parallel between the Americans in the south, the Soviets in the north. There's also a communist threat within the south. So you have external threat above the 38th parallel, but also uprisings below the 38th parallel. And of course you have the Korean War uh, of 1950 to 53 as well. So you need to understand the development of Korea within that context of continued threat from communism. The Americans obviously were very eager to overcome South Korea's technological uh, backwardness and also in their view cultural backwardness. The American occupiers said the Koreans are the Irish of the Orient. They're fun-loving, they have an inferiority complex, they love a drink and a laugh, um, but they're, they're dominate, they were dominated by the Japanese and they don't have any self-confidence. In 1947, the American occupiers tried to develop uh, a program to reform Japan. In 1948, South Korea regained self-rule. There's General MacArthur, the American occupiers, with President Syngman Rhee, who was an anti-communist authoritarian. The Americans continued to give economic assistance, and in 1950, a new American-dominated United Nations body was set up, the UN Korean Reconstruction Agency. But even in 1960, the United States State Department complained of a lack of leadership to provide, I quote, the imagination, vision, and energy to end the Korean spiritual and social confusion and to give the country a sense of unity, direction, and destiny. So up to 1960, there's still not a huge level of economic growth. Well, let's think, what was, what was this man, Rhee, trying to do between 1948 and his fall in 1960? Well, first of all, like in Japan, there was a, progress, a program of land reform, an attempt to break up the, the larger states. Hmm, but that was dangerous because you needed the, you needed the elite of larger, larger Alando to support the Americans against the communists. But what you can do, of course, is you can take the former Japanese-owned land and give that to small peasant farmers. So you could then build up support for the regime without alienating the elite. Re embarked, however, also on a program of import substituting industrialization. That was his initial strategy. And he was also highly dependent upon investment from United States aid. About three quarters of investment was American aid which re-channeled to a group which were a little bit like the Zaibatsus. They were groups of industrial conglomerates called the Chebols. They were large business court conglomerates like Hyundai. It was a cosy relationship of corruption and isolation of the economy. Well, in 1960, he fell 
and was replaced by, uh, in May 1961, by Park Chung-hee, who took part as the head of a military hunter. Now, Park had trained as an officer in the Japanese army during the war, where he served in Manchuria. After the war, he joined the South Korean army and was sentenced to death for uh, opposing Ri. He was, uh, the sentence was commuted. He rejoined the army, fought the Korean War, took over in the military junta, and then was elected president in 1963 and continued to serve until he was assassinated in 1979. So what did Park do? This is where the success really takes off. He continued some of the elements of, of Rhee's policy, but taking it in a new direction, which led to what has been called the miracle on the Han River. The Han River is the major, major river. The miracle there was the transformation of South Korea into a major industrial power. Isolationist nationalism was strong because there was a dislike of the Japanese who had colonized the country. There was dislike of dependence upon the United States. There was dislike of the big conglomerates of the Chai Bol. So Park has to take that on if he's going to have success in an export-led strategy. He promised to end corruption. So the Chai Bol I'm now going to reform. I'm going to stop them being so corrupt. I'm going to stimulate national renewal. I'm going to renew Korean culture. But he also realised he couldn't do this if he didn't have the support of the Chai Bol themselves. So he pardons those who had been ex accused of corruption, in return for which they have to support his strategy of export-led growth. Now, what is he going to do then? I think he does two things. One, create Japanese-Korean pride in its culture through what was called the Cultural Heritage Protection Act of 1962, which had a committee for erecting patriotic forefathers. So you erect massive statues of people who, in whom you could have pride. The biggest one in the middle of, of Seoul was a statue of Admiral Yi sun Shi, who defeated Japan in the war of 1592-9. to now, not just Gresham is important, but also uh, history was being remembered here. So pride in culture, but also authoritarianism, sense of the media, limit freedom of expression, and then turn to export-led growth as a way of ending dependence on American aid. So it was a combination of repression, cultural policies, allowing him to turn away from nationalist economic isolationism to nationalist expansion. Now, how do you do that? How do you create this policy of export-led growth? It's often said it rested upon Park as a military authoritarian. You wouldn't mess with him, would you? Well, I wouldn't. But it's not just that. The South Korean state under Park has been described by one leading authority, Korean authority, as authoritarian bureaucratic. It provided effective coordination and growth with highly skilled technocratic uh, officials who introduced institutional reform, improved planning, and followed the economic model of Japan. The state owns some um, factories, uh, steelworks itself, but its major role was to support private enterprise. The state, like in Japan, providing guidance through five-year plans starting in 1962, supporting heavy industry, exports. And those plans were very close to what Kishi had done in Manchuria. In fact, Kishi, as, uh, as uh, prime minister in, in, in Japan, was rather embarrassed when Park turned up and they started, he started reminiscing about all the wonderful things they had done in Manchuria in the 1930s, which is not something that you would mention in polite company in the 1960s. But skilled bureaucrats in the Economic Planning Board and the Ministry of Trade worked with a few of these chai business groups, such as Hyundai, 
Samsung, LG that dominated the economy and spread risk across a wide range of industries through cheap loans, licenses, tax benefits. It was a very interconnected group of family firms, of fa oh, sorry, family members, like you see there uh, in the, the, the Samsung uh, uh, Chai Bowl. They expanded to increase market share. They weren't necessarily driven by profit, but dominating the market by borrowing. Success depended on their ability to make deals with the state. The government provided support through loans, permits, tax cuts, subsidies, on condition that you were successful in exports. And if you were not successful, you would lose those, those perks. It was an aim of shifting the industrial structure to heavy industry, capital intensive, high value added, technologically advanced. And also, again, making sure that export growth did not lead to foreign involvement. So during this period of Park, the Chai Bor became ever more powerful. They uh, increased from 15% of total sales uh, as a percentage of GNP to 67% by 1984. So it was a state business alliance in a governed market, or what is rather more critically being called crony capitalism. Now, of course, the danger there is that reliance upon cronies uh, could lead to unpopularity. So Park also tried to do uh, did two other things. One was to create a coalition with the countryside and farmers through the New Village Movement, launched in 1970, modernised the countryside. And secondly, labour repression. You repress workers which allowed him to ignore anti-Japanese views. You hold down wages to allow the, the chai ball to compete on international markets. Now, the problem with that, of course, is at some point it's going to explode, <clears throat> which it did. So you have growing populist opposition to corporate power, favoritism, protests against low wages and repression. Park, indeed, was assassinated in 1979. <clears throat> the new president also suppressed a pro-democracy uprising in 1980, and suppression continued alongside <clears throat> a new policy, used popular culture as a distraction, to keep the workers happy. This was called the policy of the three S's, sports, sex, and screen. didn't altogether work. Here's the mass uprising in 1987. Led to the end of military rule. The new civilian government, which came in after that, saw a potential in cultural industries. <clears throat> it invested in the internet, in information, and in communication technology. But the government also continued to support the Chai Bowl. But like in Japan, a move now towards more uh, if you like, cooperation with them, trying to make them more transparent, make them specialised rather than just have this wide range of diverse uh, industries. Uh, but are now going for, if like, soft repression rather than hard repression. So this attempt to uh, remove uh, the, the chai ball or reform the chai ball wasn't entirely successful. Their continued uh, use of, of the chai balls, continued crony capitalism, reform, their reform attempts falters uh, uh, against the, the entrenched power uh, of, of these people. Crisis then hits in uh, 1997. This is partly the result of the fact that currencies in Korea and elsewhere in, in Asia were pegged to the US dollar. The US has got a lot of money to invest. If there's no exchange rate uh, risk, you might as well put it into these countries with a very high rate of return. Great, until the point emerges at which there's a fear that the currency will be devalued, which is people withdraw their money. And at that point, money is withdrawn in, 1890, in 1997. 
It exposed the risk of its high reliance upon loans to large business groups, overinvestment. The price of computer chips, one of the largest exports of Korea, collapsed. Banks were left with large loans. The IMF then intervenes and orders reform of the corporate structure, uh, reduce the role of credit in the banks. But, so then you, again, you have an attempt by Korea to regain its authority, uh, regain its uh, uh, autonomy. People hand in their gold uh, jewellery in order to pay off the IMF loan. I think that this is... Um, actually very important for when the crisis hits then in 2008, the global financial crisis. The Koreans say, we are not going to put ourselves in that same position again of being dependent upon outsiders, the International Monetary Fund. They build up a reserve. They're not hit by the global financial crisis of 2008. A lesson was learned. Also, there was a lesson learned that the, that investment in the internet pays off. Cultural industries expand. The government aimed to quadruple its exports in the cultural industries. Squid Game is a sign of the success of that policy. Growth, unlike in Japan, returns. Exports grow rapidly. Exports as a percentage of GDP were about 26% of GDP in 1995, 56% in 2012. So, research and development, investment uh, was very high. Great success, but was it? We should also look at weaknesses. A leading Korean sociologist has referred to South Korea as experiencing compressed modernity, very rapid, very condensed growth. But, he says, that was anchored in the family. The family dominated business, welfare and education. It's what he calls family-centred modernity, which overloaded the family with too much. With providing welfare, with paying for education, paying the savings to go into the investment. Which led to very high levels of suicide, divorce, violence, low fertility, delayed marriage, burden upon women and on the young, and high pressure on poor people with a very high level of household debt. Let me just mention a few things about that uh, very quickly in conclusion by looking at some tables here. Career is a highly educated society, very high proportion going into tertiary education, like in Japan. But a large part of that was paid for by individual families. A large part of the cost of education fell on families rather than the government. And that is true of welfare generally. You should see there in that table on the screen a low level of government spending with a high level of reliance upon familial self-welfare. There's also the same domination of the family in business in those chaibol. Problems of cronyism continue to exist. In 2017, the president of Korea, who was Park's daughter, was ousted and accused of demanding money from the three leading chaibol. She was sent to prison for 20 years, uh, was actually released in 2021. The chairman of Samsung was also sent to prison, but was pardoned in 2022. So, this continued domination of families and crony capitalism. Which brings us back to Squid Game. Squid Game is, I hope you've all realised when you were watching it, a critique of South Korean capitalism and inequality. For those of you who have not watched it, and you need to have quite a strong stomach to watch all of it, the premise is that 456 players of the game are in debt. They're playing for a huge money prize in children's game, but losing the game means you are killed. The players are dressed in green, which is the uniform of the new village movement I talked about, the park setup. 
they're being watched by red masked guards for the gratification of rich foreigners. Hmm, could that be the International Monetary Fund, I wonder? The script was written in 2009, and the author refers to a strike at a motor plant in 2009. The main character in the Squid Game, the one who wins the game, refers in, I think it's episode five, perhaps I'm wrong, uh, to losing his job and taking part in this strike. Squid Game is a, it shows the success of the Japanese cultural exports. It's also a critique of some of the downside of it. Squid Game, like Parasite, deals with people who are experiencing inequality and marginalisation while others prosper. So, measured by growth of the economy, Japan and Korea have been remarkably successful since 1945. Not through free market capitalism, as was advocated by the United States and the International Monetary Fund, but through state direction. The contrast with Argentina, with which I started, is striking. There, the economy stagnated. South Korea escaped from underdevelopment to become a developed economy. Argentina regressed from being one of the world's most prosperous economies to a state of underdevelopment. Although Latin America secured political independence from Spain and Portugal in the 1820s, they became economically subordinated to foreign capital in a way that both Korea and Japan avoided. What went wrong in Latin America is what I will talk about next time. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned a lot about Zaibatsus. How many yeah. of those still exist today? And if so, how powerful are they? Um, well, Mitsui still exists today. Um, uh, Mitsubishi still exists today. Uh, so that they, they were the two biggest ones. Uh, so they, uh, they, they've transformed themselves from being Zabatsu to these Kawatsu. So uh, the, these big conglomerates are, are still there. Uh, I mentioned Nissan. I think there was, there was an issue um, after the war that the Americans uh, didn't quite understand the fact they were like the old Zabatsu and the new Zabatsu. They thought they were all bad and supporting militarism, not quite realising perhaps some of the, uh, the ones like Mitsui were a bit ambivalent at least about relationship with the, uh, with, with, with the military. Nissan uh, was actually much more complicit, complicit very complicit, um, in, in uh, the, what one might consider to be war crimes in, in, in Man Manchuria. Uh, so um, they, 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 do, they, do still, they do still exist uh, in this new form, that if like devolved, networked form uh, of the Karatsu. Um, I'll, I'll take one from, uh, from Sido next. Um, the uh, uh, very interesting question of, uh, what are the lessons for UK government economic planners? from the experience of the economies of Asia? Well, that is a very, very I, good... I didn't know we had economic that, that, planners. That's a good, that's a good, that's a good question. Um, well, you might uh, have noticed that what I'm stressing in this is how the role of the state is so important. Um, that in, in, in 1997, when you have the, uh, the IMF coming in, um, they come in and they say to say to Koreans, look, you, should, you mustn't behave like this, all this state-directed stuff. You know, you've got to be like America, free markets, and, and so on and so forth. And um, a, a leading economist, um, white-wing economist, uh, pointed out, it's not the role of the IMF to come in and tell people what, what to do. And anyway, do you think there's not crony corruption in America? <laughs> um, so I think that... Um, there's an interesting if I, ideological debate there about how far should you, one have state-directed state um, development. Now, I don't think one wants to have state direction by um, somebody who is a military dictator, an authoritarian regime, and I've been pointing out some of the downsides of it. Uh, what I would say, picking up um, on a recent book by Mariana Masucato, is that we tend to downplay how important the state has been in uh, both the United States and Britain 
in, in development, like by providing money for you know, the internet, which is coming out of NASA and the um, uh, the American Defense Department and, and so on and so forth. So I think that um, the the lesson I would take here is that that long-sighted, state-directed uh, development can be a good thing, but you don't need to have that alongside authoritarianism and repression. And I've been pointing out that's part yeah. of the problem in the, in the economies here. I was going to ask, considering that both China and Japan have new Confucian um, philosophy, yeah. why did Japan succeed in becoming economically independent and China kind of collapse under the shackles of colonialism? Yeah, well, that's uh, obviously, I suppose you could say what, one of the issues that I've been pointing to is that Japan has seen what had happened to China and wanted to, wanted to make sure that that uh, didn't happen to, to them. Um, I think that, I think it's partly a matter of, of scale, perhaps. It's, it's, it's easier within, within Japan uh, to create this um, like a modern nation state, if you like, the process that I that I was outlining, um, I think it was very difficult to to do that in 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 the, in the size of China, uh, and of course it, it's um, the it, it was very difficult for the um, the dynasty there to uh, to modernise. Uh, when you have the fall of the uh, Chinese um, emperor and Sun Yat-sen becomes the, um, the, the, the leader uh, in China uh, and fails, he goes to Japan. I said, is that the way we should, we should try and proceed? So I think it's interesting that the Chinese were trying to learn from Japan in, in how to create that sense of um, if like, unity and modernity. Um, I think then what Sun Yat-sen is, is trying to do in, in that is to link a sort of new Confucianism with um, working with international agencies to come in and bring in capital. So then we can't get the capital otherwise. So I think the, the, there's an interesting interplay between Japan and China. Uh, China, if I didn't have the, the lessons from Japan until later, after the incursion by the, by the Europeans um, in the concessions that, that, were, that were forced. And then I think it's also interesting that India tries to learn from Japan as well during the Second World War. So I think there's, there's another lecture lurking there which is about <laughs> what, what happens in, in, in India. But uh, yeah, that's a, that's a very good question. Um, if I can maybe ask uh, one final question. Mm. We, we, we were talking before, yeah. the, uh, uh, before the lecture. Uh, where do you see... The, the, we've seen this incredible uh, export-driven growth in a number of countries in Asia over, over the last yeah. uh, uh, decades. What's the next tiger? The next tiger? Gosh. Well, I, by the way, I, I hope that nobody turned up thinking this is a lecture about tigers, <laughs> um, in which case you've learned something you didn't think you were going to learn. Um, the next tiger... Well, I think that obviously we got growth in Malaysia in, and in Vietnam. I obviously, in, in, in a lecture, didn't have time to go through every single country, and I wouldn't have enough knowledge uh, about it. The, the only countries that I know in this area, so my personal experience is Japan and, and Korea. I think actually the one to watch is India, uh, which is not really an Asian tiger. I, I, my suspicion is that that China has got serious problems. Now, I was talking last time about why did China succeed and Russia fail in economic modernity. I think there's serious issues now within China with the collapse of Evergrande, the property company, there's the levels of debt, uh, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but I think India is, is growing. And that's an interesting one because India, after the war, embarked on import substituting industrialization. Uh, very tight state controls, the license raj, as, as it was called, you had to have a permit to do, to do anything. But in a way which held back development rather than encouraged development. Now, uh, one doesn't necessarily agree with uh, Modi's um, Hindu nationalism. Uh, well, you know, I don't want to go into uh, other people's politics. Uh, but he is trying to break down those licenses. 
Now, I think that's an interesting question in terms of what I've been talking about here. Can you actually modernise by building a cultural identity, which can be pretty awful? So I think that's... If I were giving another lecture, if I had four lectures, Richard, <laughs> rather than three this year, it would be to look at what's going on in India. Um, Martin, I'm afraid time marches on. I'm conscious that there being many more questions we could have taken from the floor and more on Slido, which might have to lead to a podcast later on. Right. Um, however, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's been a delightful insight um, into uh, these uh, Asian tiger economies. And would you join me in thanking our visiting Professor of Economic History, <laughs> Professor Martin Norton. Thank you.